Back, 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 back at it again. Episode three in the Tigers Avenue. Let's go. <sighs> Zach, Zach, Zach. I know. I know. Another one. Another one. Another one. LSU loses another heartbreaker. Close one to the very end. 16 to 13 loss in overtime to. The piggies of Arkansas. <sighs> you know, I want to get into this, but I can't yet. I, I I can't yet. Give me your take. So it's a lot of what we had talked about in our last podcast, which was that. How would Jake Peets react to when Arkansas changed their scheme and adjusted after his first set of initial plays that he had coming into the game? Right. And as we've seen throughout the entire season, we saw the same result on Saturday, which was... The beginning's really good. Then when you have to make adjustments, it's really bad. We saw yeah. Garrett Nussmeyer, as we were told throughout the week leading up to the game, which confused me was that they had said they would rotate the quarterbacks, but they start... Max Johnson on the first two drives bringing Garrett Nussmeyer and then the rest of the game they stick with Garrett. Now, to be clear, I am fine with sticking with Garrett if you believe that he is the guy that is going to make plays that Max cannot. And I think there is some deficiencies there that Garrett has that Max doesn't. Garrett is erratic. He's kind of a balls-to-the-wall kind of guy where he's just going to go out there and try to make a play. And that's where you can get in trouble with him. He has a better arm than Max, but his decision-making isn't as good as Max. He's a little bit more mobile than Max is, but he is more likely to make a mistake than Max is. He's going to give you a big bang play where Max is going to be more of a game manager. So I'm okay with leaving him in there, but with the risk that he brings, I believe that you have to be able as an offensive coordinator to set him up to succeed. And unfortunately, Jake Peets is not doing that for any of his players. For any of them. We, not even close. We have the talent, and you've seen it. We've had we have the talent to compete and dominate other teams that we are playing in the SEC West, which as we know is a very very deep division, the best division of college football, period. And so that's the really frustrating part. I think once you see Garrett throw that first interception, I would have liked to see them go back to Max and at least see if he can get the ball moving as well. Because Garrett, when he came into the game, they did move the ball. Now, I will say part of that was probably likely to Trey Palmer's two really good returns. Um, Max wasn't set up well to when he started the game. They were starting in their own territory. And when Garrett came into the ball game, Trey Palmer 
from his two returns set them up in Arkansas's territory. And so that set up well for Garrett. Once Garrett had faltered some near the end of the first half and thrown that pick is when I think they should have made a change. And then if you don't see anything happen with Max, then you go back to Garrett and see if he can spark something. I don't understand why you put Garrett in the game after two series and then you stick with him the rest of the way. If that was your plan, then why not start the guy? Why put Max Johnson in for those first two series? So that was very confusing. The other thing that frustrated with me was, again, the offensive play calling. I don't understand why you were putting Ty Davis Price in a situation to where he is running the Wildcat for the first time in his career. And in that drive, you had finally started to get Garrett into a rhythm with little short intermediate passes. He threw the intermediate pass to Jack Besh that went for a good bit. He threw the pass to Jack Mashburn the next play, which almost he almost fumbled and gave up. Luckily, it went out of bounds. But you began to see Garrett get into a rhythm, and then you throw Ty Davis Price, of all the running backs, you throw Ty Davis Price out there, who is a bruiser, to run the Wildcat. And a running back with his style of play is not going to handle a snap that is a little far to the right as well as a quarterback is. And that cost us. I mean, that's the difference in the game. So that was very frustrating. And I don't blame that on Ty Davis Price because, again, I think most of this is the failure of the offensive coordinator setting up his players to succeed with their strengths and their playmaking ability. And so I hate it for the offense. They're so loaded, even without Kayshawn Booty in the game and even without John Emery eligible this year, they're still a very talented and loaded roster that is able to compete and beat these teams that we've lost to. If you have a competent offensive coordinator in this game, you very likely beat Arkansas. You very likely beat Auburn. You beat Alabama two weeks ago. I won't say Ole Miss. The deficit was much greater. And even so with Kentucky, but the good news is changes are coming. The problem is, I just hope that we can retain all of these guys. Change is coming, indeed. Let me tell you something, Zach. I'm irritated. I'm frustrated. Understandably so. And I'm sick and tired, weak. After week after week, watching the same problems over and over again. This is why we are having conversations. Who's the next coach? This is why Coach O is a lame duck coach. He can't make coordinator hires. He can't keep himself straight off the field, and it shows on the field. It's a horrible display of pitiful football Week in and week out, and this is why we're having the discussions of who's the next coach. The defense did it again. The defense gave you every opportunity to win this game. They completely shut down Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks had 16 yards on the the game. On the whole game, Traylon Burks, the best, arguably the best receiver in in the SEC, one of the best in the nation, 16 yards. K.J. Jefferson only threw for 142 and in one touchdown and had less than a 50 QBR rating on the game. This carousel of running backs that they had, none of them got over 50 yards rushing in this game. This is inexcusable, stale cracker, 
awful offense every single game. This offense is so pathetic, it is not even funny. Put the ball in your playmaker's hands in crucial situations. It is so simple. It is it's so simple. Just like you said, Garrett Nussmeyer, he came in, he comes in, he's a firecracker, he's ready to go, he's a gunslinger. Give him plays to be successful. Put the ball in Jack Besh's hands. Put the ball in Ty Davis Price's hand. Tidy TDP had 106 yards rushing on this game. And when you have the possession at the very end of the game with less than a minute to go and it's fourth and inches, this man just ripped off three runs all over 10 yards. And you don't give him the ball fourth and inches? You, you go up and try to draw a penalty? Yeah. Give him the ball and go down and try to win the game? What are you doing? It's inexcusable. And I'm, I'm just sick and tired every single week of the same stuff. Put the ball in the playmaker's hands. It's so simple. This offense is so dry. It's so pathetic. I cannot stand to watch it anymore. I, I don't care if we're bowl eligible. I don't care. I, I would, Honestly, at this point, I don't care to get a bowl because I don't want to watch another game with this stale cracker offense. It's awful. And it's pathetic. And this is why that... Coach O and this entire staff is going to be gone this year. I don't even blame Jake Peets. I don't blame Jake Peets. I blame Coach O for hiring somebody who's never called offensive plays in a football game in his entire career, and you bring him to LSU, one of the top-tier programs of all of college football, and he's a learning on the job how to call plays. It's inexcusable. I don't even blame him. I don't blame him. This is not a school where you come to learn on the job. This is not a school where you come be an offensive coordinator for the first time in your career. It's not. You can go to Texas Tech. You can go to Virginia Tech. You can go to ULL or all these schools like that and go be a first-time coordinator. LSU is not a place for a first-time coordinator. It's inexcusable. I take my hat off to Durante Jones for this defense continuing to push and have passion and drive and play fantastic these past two weeks. It was an incredible, impressive performance by the defense. Unfortunately, our offense gives them nothing to help them win this game. But, as you said, change is coming, and the end cannot get here soon enough. I cannot wait until we hire a new coach that has a competent brain to hire somebody who's competent and who has called football plays in game before. Because this is ridiculous. The fact that we had to go to overtime in our own stadium against this kind of Arkansas team is inexcusable. We had every opportunity to win that game. Every opportunity. And they failed because of this offensive scheme. We called it. I mean, we literally called it in previewing this game. We literally said the key to this game is will Jake Peets be able to adjust mid-game? We got the answer. The answer is no once again. And I rest my case. And It's one, inexcusable. One of the most frustrating things to me was just the series of plays that ended LSU's hopes in overtime. So you get the sack, um, and you're backed way up. It's third and a mile. Third and, and twenty. And yeah, and give give Pete's credit or DJ Mangus, because I've heard that apparently DJ Mangus calls the third down plays. They draw up a wonderful play that Garrett Nussmeyer ends up throwing a dart to Malik Neighbors and completes it. I mean, at that point, you're like, okay, let's just try and get a little bit of yardage. Let's get a field goal. Our defense has been dominant. Let's stop them. Let's get to the next one where we have the second possession and we know what we've got. And we've got a chance to know exactly what we have to do. If they can get a field goal, we can go down and win the game with the touchdown. You complete that pass improbably and then you draw up a fade from the eight yard line mm. to Devontae mm. Lee mm. Mm, 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 mm. and I'm not hating on Devontae Lee at all 
He's an athlete. He's no. at LSU no. for a reason. But we know that he is probably four, five, sixth on this wide receiver depth chart. And when you're throwing a fade, you go to Brian Thomas, who is your tallest dude, and you mm-hmm. if you're going to run that play, that's the personnel you put into the game for that play. Again, you do not set up your players to succeed. You did not set up Garrett Nuxmeyer to succeed on that play by putting Devontae Lee out there on the outside and running a fade. After you make that big play, I'm with you. Go back to TDP, who's been a workhorse for you. I hope he comes back next year. Exactly. He may not. I believe he will. He may not, with how he's been performing lately, he may try and go to the pro combine. I, I'm with you. I think he comes back, though. It'll be awesome to see if John Emery comes back and you have that thunder and lightning next year. But I'm with you. It, it, it's really, really yeah. frustrating. And it's frustrating you- to see all of the talent that you have to, just to not be able to run and any sort not of efficient it. offense. And you're, you look at a couple, you look at last year when you had Steve Ensminger and you lose all those guys from 2019 who were first rounders. And you know what Steve Ensminger did? He led that offense and all of those freshmen and all that young talent to 32 to, I think it was 32 or 33 points a game. Right? You come back next year, those guys have another year of experience. It's the same personnel. And because your head coach doesn't have the ability to go out and hire a competent offensive coordinator, as you said, at the top-tier program that LSU is with the resources and the money that they have, this is why we have the result on the field. So I'm with you 100. percent um, It's frustrating. It's it, it's 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 very very. It makes Change me very angry. But yeah, you're right. Change, Change is, is coming. coming, and we don't have to talk about. Thank forever. the Lord, change is coming. But thank the Lord for Scott Woodward. Yes, in Scott Woodward, we trust. We've said it before, but in Scott Woodward, we trust, and I'm looking forward to who the next guy is. And man, is he going if we are able to retain what we have, he is going to have a fantastic starter pack loaded for next year. And also loaded. depending I mean, on what he loaded. could bring in potentially from the transfer portal or from his own team or flipped recruits. I mean, the potential to contend for a national title next year is there. And I know a lot of fans are like, what in the world? You're crazy to think that from what you see this year. And that's just how bad it is with what we have right now. I mean, you're literally staring five and seven in the face and looking at your first losing record since the 1990s, since 99, the year before Nick Saban came. It had. We have not had a losing season. We've had some rough seasons, but we have not had a l- losing Ridiculous. season since '99. Yeah, twenty years. Twenty years, Reagan. Over twenty years. Twenty-two. Since 22. we've had a losing record, and we are staring it right in the face, unless they can pull off some miracle against Texas A&M. I, I believe it's going to be a close game. Against A and M, and that the defense is it's going to keep you in it. It's not a far stretch if the offense can do something. But I don't believe they're going to beat them because of the offense. I'm with you. So yeah. Anyways, it's we've, not we've a far stretch to think you can beat A and M. Yeah, we've ran long on football, but you can, you listeners can hear our frustration. But as we've said, change is coming, and we're looking forward to it. Can't wait! Can't wait to see what happens. We'll leave it at that. 
Another tough loss. Moving on to some positivity. LSU men's basketball. Whew. Boot up, baby. Two wins. Boot up general way, boy. Yet to allow a team to score 60 points in three games. Beating Texas State 84-59. to First half was weak. Second half was strong. And the new guys balled out. The new guys balled out. Freshman Alex Fudge, 14 points. Freshman Brandon Murray, 14 points. Transfer sophomore Terry Eason puts up another double-double against Texas State off the bench. I don't know how much longer you can keep Terry Eason on the bench and out of the starting five. I love what imwani has been doing, but he has not put up the points and the stuff that Terry's doing. And with double-doubles back-to-back, I, I, I don't know how you can keep him on I, the bench. I think that's where I might disagree with you a little bit there because – I think the veteran leadership by Milwaukee and the defense that he brings to this team is sets up well for this team to make him a starter. And then you bring somebody like Terry Eason off the bench that can put up those numbers. So right now I'm kind of, I'm okay with it because I think Whenever you He's he, not playing terrible. No, yeah. No, he's not playing terrible. I mean By shoot, he had means. a three the other night against Liberty. Um but he's playing fantastic defense and to add on to what you had said a second ago about the defense, an interesting fact from these past three games. LSU has it's either ten or more, but I know for sure it's at least ten. At least ten Forced shot clock violations in these three games. They had five. Huge. Five versus Texas State. Three versus yep. ULM. I know of at least two against Liberty on Monday night. So this team, they are coming ready to play. You mentioned earlier three games, three teams held under 60 points. You want to know how many teams LSU held to under 60 points in all of last year? Three. How many? Three. Three. So we have already tied. We're three for three this year. And we had three last year. And I think there was a total of, in Will Wade's first few seasons, like seven or so. I'd have to go back and look at Cody Worsham. Um, He put it out. But anyways, yeah, I saw that stat on Monday night, and I just thought that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, just impressive defense. I want to move on for the Texas State game because it was a good win, but it wasn't as good as the win that came Monday night against Liberty. A 74-58 yes. to hard-fought game from the Tigers. A little bit of the same story. Uh, from the Texas State game, really tough first half. Kind of looked rough, but, man, second half was strong. They had this player, uh, their starting shooting guard. His name's Darius McGee. Dude is a serious NBA prospect. He is a baller. And the first half, he was causing a lot of problems. Let me tell you something. This defense that we're talking about, that has been elite in the second half, completely eliminated Darius McGee from the game, and that was one of the key factors in LSU pulling away late. Eric Gaines and Xavier Pinson completely took him out of their entire offense, and once that happened, it was it was like, who do we go to? Who do we go they to? Had, they had to go to Peebles. And they couldn't freshman. figure it out. They had to go to Peebles, and he, and he put up a few points, but he did. It, he he's not Darius back. McGee. Yeah, and but but he couldn't keep up for what Darius was doing, and it was a huge, huge success in this game. And it was, it's something that could go missed, but man, that it was so much fun watching Eric Gaines just lock that man down. I mean, they wouldn't even allow him to touch the ball hardly. I mean, they had to inbound the ball and work it to him in the back court to if they wanted to give him the ball. If they came into the front court, he wasn't touching the ball. It was impressive, and I, I was just thrilled um, by their effort to eliminate that 
in that game. Um, man, one more thing for here for basketball. Darius Days. Darius Days continues Go to ahead. be unreal. He is balling out. 17 points again against Texas State. Which was a 26 struggle. 26 points. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's supposed to be supposedly a down game for him so far. But 26 points against Liberty was huge late in the game it on in the with last several six threes. minutes. Oh my goodness. This team in the he, last 6 he minutes turned was it up. He elite. turned it up. They were elite impressive in the last 6 minutes. You had uh, Will Wade likes to break down the game in 6 minute intervals. And the first the it was really like the middle 6 minute interval of that second half, you really started to believe that Liberty's going to pull away cuz that's when people started hitting some even though they had locked down McGee, they kind of started pulling away a little bit. And you thought for a second, ooh, we might we might lose this one. And then it's like everything just flipped a switch. And I believe it was around maybe the 8 minute mark I believe it was five minutes around. I have to go back and look at the at my game notes that I that I had when I was watching it the other night. I believe it was around five minutes that Liberty went without a made bucket, and the only points they had wow. were two free throws. And then wow. I believe they got some more. Maybe, uh, it was an easy backdoor missed assignment bucket. I think it was within the four minute mark, uh, four minutes to go in the game. But I mean that that might be the best six minutes of bas- LSU basketball that I've ever watched. It's, it's hard it was, to recall another another team that put on just the defensive on top of the offensive display that they put on on Monday night. It was impressive. And another thing that you just got to highlight is the how big this game is. This is a huge resume game for when we talk about seeding and if we're talking about LSU getting to the tournament, which I believe LSU will, this is a big resume game. Liberty will be a quad win type of game when we go to looking at resumes close to March Madness time. This was a huge game for that, and we won by 16 points. Uh, Their coach, McVay, has completely turned the Liberty program around within the six years that he's been there. Uh, I think I saw the stat the other night. The program, like six years before McVay was there, was like 85 for a hundred and something, and since he's been there, it's been like a hundred something and fifty. So just a complete one eighty for this program. So this is a huge win for LSU, and I think this speaks to one of Will Wade's strengths. Will Wade has been killing it, as we all know, in recruiting. I mean, he's put several classes together that have just been completely impressive, and he himself, like McVeigh, has turned the lackluster LSU basketball program into something people want to watch and people enjoy. He indeed is embodying this general Wade persona, this boot up era, and it's been a whole lot of fun. And I think one of the major things that he does so well is scheduling games. I think it's overlooked, but his scheduling is impressive. He creates a resume for LSU that makes it easy for them to get into the tournament when it comes to tournament time. When you have quad wins like this early in the year, it, it, it and then you go into conference play, those you look back and you see those games, and then you see what they did in conference, it's, it's easy to put them into the tournament. It, it's almost a no-brainer. So I, I think this is just speaks to um, how mindful he is of where he wants the program to go. He's a genius the when it comes to goal. He's yeah. a genius when it comes to understanding what the committee is looking for on selection Sunday. Yeah. Um absolutely. And he has done that 
for the last several years that he's been at LSU. I mean, when's yeah. the last? Help me out here. When's the last time that LSU didn't go to the tournament? I mean, <laughs> before we got Will Wade. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe the first year he was there. I'd have to go back and check that out. The first year that he was there, did we go? First year's there, he may, he may, we may, and I missed it. I think it, we may have missed it, but I think ever since, since the first then, year we've been. Yeah, I think ever since then, maybe the second year, we've been every single year. And now the COVID year took all that out, and yeah. we were an easy tournament team. Of but, course. But yeah, I, but yeah, I, it's been impressive. It's been impressive, and I'm thrilled to see what he's been doing and the direction the program's heading in. It's exciting, and I can't wait to continue to watch the rest of the season. Um, it, it's going to be exciting. They do have another game uh, Thursday night against McNeese State. This is this is, looks to be somewhat of a, a ULM type of game. McNeese State is really uh, not going to pose much of a threat to this elite LSU basketball team. The big one uh, is they after will be McNeese back in the team against Mel, uh, Belmont. Belmont is, will be another. Again, his scheduling is is excellent. Belmont will be another big game for resume, and uh, I can't wait to watch that one as well. All right, so moving from the hardwood to a little bit of baseball, LSU uh, finished up their uh, scrimmages, their exhibition games. Uh, this past weekend against ULL Ragin' Cajuns. Played two games on two separate days. The Tigers took both of them, 8-6 to six and 9-8. to eight. A little bit closer than you may have wanted it to be, but uh, you cannot discredit the Ragin' Cajuns. They always have a great baseball program. And, of course, this is uh, preseason uh, matchup, so you're not going to see everything on full display. And the and the, the starting nine that you've been seeing for these preseason games are probably not where you're going to expect day to day when it comes to regular season. However, um, in our first podcast, our first episode, we gave our predictions on the starting nine. Zach said Tyler McManus would be his catcher, and I said Blaze Priester. I'm here to tell you, I think I'm wrong. I believe now that Tyler McManus will be the starting catcher. Zach, I don't know if you've been keeping up with what he's been doing, but it seems like every single game the man hits a home run. Grand slammy. He did it on a Grand Saturday. Grand slam. Yeah. It was the game. It was game one against ULL. The man hits another home run, and it was a grand slam that really stretched the Tigers' leads and and put the game away, essentially. And his tear of homers in the preseason continues to happen. Jordan Thompson also at, at shortstop had a great time at the plate. He was four for seven through both games, had a home run, had a triple, and, and drove in four runs. Uh, we saw that uh, you know from him last year a little bit. Uh, he, he, he may be small and a little scrawny looking, but the dude can swing the bat. If oh, I remember correctly, he had eight home runs last year. Yeah, the dude can drive it. The dude can drive it. There's no doubt about it. Will Safford also had a really good game um, when he went out there. You know, that was a guy that you kind of were expecting to fade right. into the background a little bit with all the, the just roster talent that is on this team. But uh, he definitely came out and displayed his talent this past weekend. Yeah, it, it seems like he had a really great defensive game as well. Not just not just at the plate. He played well defensively, and that was a struggle for him, right? Uh, Zach Arnold had some finger issues, uh, some hand issues when we went to uh, the regionals against Oregon, and we had to plug Will Safford in, and I, he it felt like every time the ball came at him, it, it was an error, or he, he may not committed an error, but he fumbled the ball around or kicked the ball around and finally got the out. Um, so to see him progressing and, and getting better uh, defensively is also something uh, to keep an eye on. Um, pitching was said, pitching was said to be a little shaky 
in, in this series, and I think it kind of shows in the final scores, six runs uh, in the first game and eight runs in the second game. And as Tiger fans, you may, you know, you may get a little worried about that. Um, but they, this is preseason. And again, they pitch a lot of pitchers, uh, a lot of young pitchers to get them experience, kind of some in game looks. Um, but we'll see how that pans out. And we'll keep an eye on that as well as we get closer to the season. I'm not too worried about the pitching uh, because this staff seems to be loaded. Um, Zach, I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I'm not too worried about it. I'm not either. You know, they're going to be getting a lot of guys out there that are going to be way down in the bullpen. This bullpen, this bullpen is deep and it is very talented. And as you said earlier, in these preseason exhibition games, these matchups in the fall, they're really just tinkering this Jay Johnson tinkering to see uh, all the talent that he's got from top to bottom. And so that doesn't really worry me a lot because you're going to go and throw everybody out there that you have on your roster just to see what guys can do. And so, of course, in games like this, you're going to see where your top tier guys are and where you're sitting in the dugout all year guys are. (laughs) Yeah, and and maybe guys where you you pitch them only it's situational uh, times, maybe some midweek games. Um, so again, don't discredit these these exhibition games as you know just fluke games or whatever. I think it's a great opportunity for Jay Johnson and the coaches to fill out the team, see what they're rocking with, and man, it looks to be. An exciting year. The build for this team is continuing to happen. It's been really, really good to be able to get a preview of this team because we're not going to see this team live in action for a while. We're going to be watching basketball for a long time until February, I believe. Yeah, February. The first game will be. So just getting to see – some stats thrown out there and what the boys are doing is really, really exciting and encouraging, especially what's with what's going on with football right now. Um, it, we're lucky to be able to have a really good basketball and baseball team and even women's basketball with Kim Mulkey leading that charge just to be able to view in and, and enjoy considering this season in football. Absolutely. I agree. It has it has definitely helped with the the excitement of the basketball and the baseball to to cope with the just pathetic efforts of uh, the football and this offense. Bring us another and, eight, Will Wade, please, dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Do something to get us excited, please. Bring us to a super yeah. week, Jay Johnson, please, dear Lord. <laughs> Hosting, hosting is Uber regional, <laughs> please. Yes, Omaha, yeah. Omaha it's, bus, Omaha bus, baby. It's exciting. It, it, it's it feels like we're entering a, a really great time for LSU with what Will Wade is doing with the basketball program, with the excitement of Jay Johnson, uh, the Kim Mulkey era coming in, three time national champion, and now Scott Woolward gets to make the big hire. Uh, for the football program. So it feels like we're entering into some great times for LSU and its future. Zach, I know we got a little bit uh, or a good bit of hog fans uh, that are friends of ours. We just got to say, you know, a blind hog finds an acorn every now and then. Hey, that's it for this episode. Episode number three. We appreciate y'all listening. We'll be back here again for episode number four in the Tigers Avenue. Catch y'all later. Peace.